inside the all-new Jeep Grand Cherokee two-row. And when you get into one of these for the very first time, you can tell Jeep has put a lot of effort into shedding their once-deserved image of subpar interiors. And for the most part, they've done a good job making this feel like a far more special cabin. And when you think about it, they have the unenviable task of making the Grand Cherokee all things to all people, and they've built it to compete in a wide variety of price points. The Grand Cherokee starts in the high 30s and ends at nearly $80,000. And when you look at the interior space, purely from an ergonomics perspective, they've done a good job. There's a lot of glass, which means you have good visibility. There's good headroom in this thing. The rear seats are very comfortable for both full-size adults and children, and the trunk space is very competitive for its segment. And on top of that, the load floor is nice and low, which means it should be easy for you to get your things in and out of it. When it comes to the Summit Reserve, the front seats are very comfortable. There's a ton of adjustment. They're heated, cooled, and massaging. And the general storage of this cabin is quite good. Your door cards are quite deep. You have a huge center console area, and your glove box is enormous. When it comes to the way you actually interact with this vehicle, thankfully, unlike many of their competitors, Jeep has not moved to haptic feedback or touch everything. The control structure is largely physical, whether it be your steering wheel controls, your HVAC, or infotainment controls. Speaking of the infotainment, they have moved towards Android Automotive, which gives them some flexibility when it comes to OTA security and speed. The menu structure for the infotainment system is also quite logical. Your gauge cluster in this car is all digital, which is either a pro or a con, but there's a ton of auxiliary information in it if you're off-roading, using this thing to tow, or if you're just curious in what your truck is doing. Really, my only complaint with this cabin, other than the proliferation of piano black materials found throughout, is the audio system. And at over $70,000, you have the right to be picky. In short, we had the audio engineer that we use test the system objectively, and it's not gonna win any awards. Now to expand out a bit on some of Jack's discussion about the audio system and some of the negatives, there seems to be a purposeful decision here to ramp up the bass to unbelievable levels. That combined with what seems to be poor subwoofer quality, you have this boominess in here. The bass is always overwhelming. Even if you dial down the bass EQ a bit, it's just not enough. It sounds like you have cotton balls in your ear. All the detail has been destroyed. And it's a, it's a bad thing because all the other testing looks good and you can tell there's potential here. Maybe this is something they can tune out in the one of the OTAs to kind of smooth that out or give you some subwoofer control or to get rid of that purposeful curve that they put in. The last thing to talk about is some of the attention to detail and quality. When you first look at this, you're like, man, they did a great job here. This is the, some of the best stuff they've ever done in terms of design, style, material choice. You have alloys, you have wood veneers, everything's tied together. There's soft touch materials. It feels like a high-end space. But some of the attention to detail and touch points is lacking in terms of quality. And this is little stuff they could fix over, the t over time. It's not a deal breaker. Things like on the steering wheel, the controls here have a huge amount of deflection on the side and this trim piece is constantly creaking when you're using it. The armrest, despite the high quality leather feel and the softness, when you go to release the lever to pull it up, it feels like they used a two cent plastic piece. This release is so sharp from the molding that they didn't smooth out. It's like, why spend all this money on other parts and then cheap out here where places you're touching? The piano black is all scratched up because this is a high input area where your fingers are always turning. So this whole ring is scratched up underneath it. I mean, there's little things like this in different spots and you just wonder like, you know they can fix this stuff and hopefully they will. But the last thing to talk about is all the UI design and the infotainment. The main screen is all digital. The center stack screen is digital. The passenger has their own screen and there's two fire tablets in the back or Amazon fire tablets with individual remotes. The back screens are ultra quick. It's like what you expect on a tablet. The usability of the screen quality is great and you can stream basically all your favorite content. And then you can mirror a lot of that to the passenger side. It's blacked out to the driver with the polarization on it. So when you look at it on the passenger side, you see everything, but the driver's not distracted. And with network streaming to the center screen and the passenger side, it's nice on road trips that you can use it, but there are frames dropped. There is some lag because it's not real time like it is in the back seats. But Jack had the opportunity to talk to their lead UX designer and kind of get his philosophy on how, to, how he designed this interior space. <laughs> So I'm Vince Galante. I'm the global head of user experience. 
And so basically what my team does is all of the design of things on the screen. So how they look, how they work, um, and how they're, you know, how do we create an experience within the car. So I hear you're also responsible for my user experience when it comes to actually having a physical control structure in the car. Yeah. So why in the modern age of 2021 did you decide not to go to all touch everything? Okay, so <laughs> you would think that the, the UX guy would want to put everything on the screens, right? But driving a vehicle is, is very different than operating a phone or a tablet, especially a Jeep. So we want to make sure that if we're going to put something on the screen, it wants to be something you can get to in one or two presses at the most. But there's just some things that are better as a physical control. So the volume knob I use as an example. Like when I'm driving my car, I reach over, I touch it, I'm done. It's the easiest, easiest way to change the volume. You can feel it, you know where it's at, you don't even have to look. You have a lot of screens in this car. I think, what, seven screens? Which, what's the mentality behind that? Sure, yeah. You, yeah, they're all, so there's a lot of displays in here. They're all 10 inch displays. And you would think, like you said, that that's gonna make something that's very distracting. Well, actually it's the opposite. So think about if you had a whole family in this car. So we, we've put, put uh, information in front of the driver that's all of the things you need, like speed, navigation, um, music. The passenger screen actually uh, can help send navigation to the driver, can help do device management for the driver, but they can also control the rear seat entertainment. So, you know, what we're actually doing by that is distributing the experience across the cabin. So actually taking tasks away from the driver that maybe the kids in the back are, are screaming, you know, pause the movie, change the movie, do this. The passenger can actually take care of that for the driver so they can focus on the road. So the displays theoretically in this cabin are limiting the amount of distraction that the driver has to deal with if the cabin's yeah. full of people. Absolutely, yeah, and it, it really comes down to when we design the experience for this car, really focusing on what's important for that particular seat. We are looking at the Jeep Grand Cherokee on the lift. However, because I was in Cabo with uh, some of my fans, I sent Jack to Moab where you got to have a grand old time with this. Tell me about it. Yes, I got to interview the chief engineer, David, who's gonna walk us through all their mechanical changes to this platform. My name is David Partlow. I'm the chief engineer for the Jeep Grand Cherokee. So walk me through the platform that this all new Jeep Grand Cherokee is on. A lot of people talk about how this is essentially a Stelvio underneath. Clearly that's not entirely true. So walk me through how you've changed the platform. So originally uh, we did start out having some sharing, right? But this is a unique platform for this, for this vehicle. We've modified it specifically for our uh, specific impact and propulsion systems requirements. Now, if you look at, if you were able to take the rail out and look at it, you know, the physics would say they would look somewhat similar, but it has been modified specifically for Jeep. So when we look at the front suspension, the yep. prior generation vehicle was also double wishbone, correct? That is correct. How is this double wishbone different than the prior generation Jeep Grand Cherokee? So this is different in that in, in the bottom, as opposed to having an A-arm, you have two specific links. You have a steering link and a comfort link. Uh, both with ball joints at the end. It's called a virtual ball joint uh, front suspension. What it allows us to do is it allows us to tune each link for its purpose, whether it be steering and handling or comfort. So we've been able to improve your on-center precision when you're driving down the road. As you, as you move to off-center, the response is better and all the time the comfort is 20% improved over harshness events. So you've also altered the rear suspension as well, correct? That is correct. Uh, the previous generation had a four link rear suspension and with all of the improvements we had in the front suspension, we clearly knew that we had to improve the rear suspension. Uh, we've adopted a five link suspension that just is more capable and it really allows us to balance the performance front to rear to have a, a, a truly balanced vehicle. So what does the five link allow you to do where the versus the four link? What does that extra link allow you to achieve? So it allows you to, to better position the stiffness so you can control the rear of the vehicle and it allows the rear of the vehicle to follow the front of the vehicle better 
So it feels more connected when you're driving down the road. When you go through a, a curve, you'll notice that the front and the rear seem very connected. That's what the five link and the rear bring to us. So let's talk about all-wheel drive systems. You guys okay. talk about how you have three, four-wheel or all-wheel drive systems. Can you walk me through how each one of them are technically different than sure. one another? The first one is uh, Quadratrack 1. It has a one-speed T-case. It's okay. an active T-case. So it's constantly monitoring where do I send that torque, but it only has one ratio. Then we have Quadratrack 2, which is a two-speed transfer case. So now it has two speeds. What that allows is it allows for kind of a on-road four-wheel drive performance, as well as when you go off-road, it has a different gear ratio that's lower. Um, this vehicle has a 44 to one crawl ratio, which allows, it just allows the wheels to better move you over the off-road events. Okay. Um, and, and that's a big improvement that we see for our customers. Then we go to the Quadra Drive 2, which includes a uh, electronic limited slip differential in the rear, and it allows you to send 100% of the torque to the left or 100% of the torque to the right. Those are the three uh, uh, four-wheel drive systems that we have on the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Understood. Now, when it comes to suspension, you mm -hmm. have a passive coil spring, correct, with a passive damper, and then you that have is... an air ride with a adaptive damper, correct? That is correct. Okay. So uh, obviously, you know, we have a, a standard passive system with a steel spring, okay. right? And uh, we have on the air suspension vehicles with semi-adaptive damping, um, that comes in at Trailhawk, uh, Overland, and Summit. And what it really allows is, so you've got a piston with rebound and compression uh, valve stack like you would normally expect. You've got a base valve, but then on the side of the unit, there is a separate loop. So it's a, it's a twin tube and there's like a separate loop on top of the twin tube. And in that there's a, uh, there's a separate valve stack that is then looking at changing the force velocity curve to, to basically perform within a band um, to either provide maximum comfort or uh, maximum control. We tune this for both on-road driving experience. You, you know, it would immediately come to mind, um, you know, on-road handling performance, but we also tune this for off-road. We have a feature where we actually look at as you get to the end of the travel, how do I make it more comfortable? So you'll notice uh, today when you drive off-road and off-road too, it's much more co comfortable off-road because we know where we are in the position of the stroke and we adjust the force velocity curves effectively. Can you walk me through the powertrain option? So one of the things that have come up quite a bit, at least from people online, is that, oh, these, these drivetrains are dated. They're from the prior generation uh, Cherokees. How are they different? What have you done to improve them? Or how has the overall package of this vehicle changed the way the powertrains work? Okay, so we start out with the 3.6 liter, which you'll, you are correct. It's a very familiar uh, package. But what you'll notice is we've improved the uh, engine stop-start performance. It's much smoother. On the 5.7, again, a very familiar package. Um, we did specifically take into account some of those tuning elements that we talked about. Um, we have active engine mounts on this vehicle. It allows us on to- On both the six and the eight? On both the 3.6 liter and the 5.7 liter. For example, on the 5.7 liter, what this allows us to do is when you go into multi-cylinder uh, displacement, where you actually are only running a portion of the cylinders, we can change the engine mounts so that we can reduce the tactile vibration. So yes, even though it's the 5.7 that you know and love and has 7,200 pounds of towing capacity, it's smoother than you would remember. Can you walk me through the body structure changes for this vehicle? The, the mixed material strategy you mentioned during the presentation, how the track width is wider. Can we walk through that? Sure, absolutely. So one of the things we started with is we lengthened the track by 36 millimeters or 1.4 inches, but we kept the outside of the vehicle. We really wanted to keep the outside of the proportions the same because it's the right size vehicle. So we effectively stretched the wheels in the package. Um, we stretched the wheelbase by two inches. We added one inch to the front uh, safety structure and 19 millimeters to the second row seat. Um, we used a variety of uh, advanced and high strength steel materials. And as I mentioned, what I really find interesting is it only leaves 27% mild steel in the safety cage of this vehicle. So if, when it comes to the body structure, do you have any aluminum components like fenders, hood, roof, anything along those lines, or is it primarily steel body panels? It's primarily st steel body panels, but what we did do is in those structural components, we took advantage of the aluminum lightweight. So the front shock towers are cast aluminum. The front end module carrier is aluminum. The front cradle is a series of extrusions and castings. 
um, that is solid mounted to the body, which allows for a more direct and precise connection of the front suspension links to the body, which allows them to be en engineered to meet their true purpose. Jeep Grand Cherokee, Mark, we've already done the three row, but now it's time to experience the two row with a V8. At least you get a V8. I can get a twin turbo V8 and my X5. But your X5 isn't $38,000. Well, this one isn't $38,000 <laughs> either. This is no, my, my X5 with the twin turbo V8 is like $100,000. And the one we're in is like 73, I think is tested, maybe 74. It's still a very expensive truck. And I've spent a lot of time in this thing. I spent time in it in Moab. I took it off road. I drove it up the mountains. I have really experienced pretty much everything the Grand Cherokee has to offer. I'm gonna leave you with my thoughts on it. I think there are two things to think about. At the lower price points, when you get a limited or <clears throat> not one that's fully, fully loaded like this, it's a really competitive offering. You still get the premium undercarriage and the, like, the suspension architecture, being a rear bias system with double wishbones. But as you move up where this thing is priced, it's a harder sell. It's a really hard sell. I don't know how Jeep is going to try to get someone out of something like a Audi Q7 or a BMW X5 or even yeah. an Acura MDX. I, I see. I, I look at this and I, I look at the price and I, and then, to be fair to them, I look at this and <clears throat> this is an expose of everything that you can option out. And Which I, don't, I doubt many people. Yeah, can do. I don't. I don't think it, it. Some of this stuff is gimmicky, but some of it is actually really cool. Like the fact that I can put my 21 year old girlfriend in here and have a screen on the passenger side where she can sit on social media and take selfies of herself live and see what her view counts are. <laughs> I like that feature, but you don't need it. You know what no. I mean? And this, it doesn't hurt it. And you're going to save thousands of dollars getting rid of some of this stuff. I don't think that all the technology is completely perfect, but they did a really good job overall, and I'm super impressed with, one, the quietness. I love the V8 in here, and I know people are gonna argue the fuel economy sucks, but naturally aspirated, it's smooth as butter, it has a great resonance to it, it feels like a hefty premium vehicle because of it. The driving experience is also really good, like really good and comfortable. Yeah, the ride, the ride quality is good. It doesn't feel like this ponderous boat like some of its competition does. Again, particularly when you compare it to things like the Pilot or the Highlander when you're in the lower trim levels. But I think it does a good job. My problem with it, and it's it's not really necessarily a problem, I think a lot of its capabilities, the whole Jeep thing, is wasted on a large portion of the population. Yeah. The fact that you can drive this anywhere, and you really can, it is extraordinarily capable for most people who don't live in the snow belt. Yeah. I don't know if you're really... <laughs> it, it, this is an interesting one, because we talk about this with product planners and other manufacturers. Like, what is your car, just no bullshit, what is your car doing that other cars don't do? And this one has a definitive one. You can forget about the tech, you can forget about all the other stuff and the, the differentiators. The mechanical engineering of yes, this. Yes, this separates itself by being that one-off like truly off-road and we're talking about like rock crawling all the stuff that you did it will do all of those things that some of the other you could not do that in a pilot no, you could not you do that want in a, to, you no. would want to do it in x5 or some of these premium products because you're going to destroy them if yes. i go and rip off a bumper on my uh, q5 rs q5 <laughs> or you know my q7 you know those are not designed for this so it's for that like 5% of people that really need the off-road capability and it's not fake. It's not a gimmick here and that's why this separates itself so much from those other cars. And trucks. the V6 in this, the Panastar, which we don't have when you compare it to what's found in, you know, again, the cheaper competition, it's great. It just, when you get up against like the X5 the, with yes. the B58, this feels archaic I because it is, is old. I think this is honest. They're honest about what they're competing with here and they're playing on their strong points they're not going to outdo an Audi. They're not going to do outdo a BMW in certain elements of luxury. But where they're outdoing it is it does have a solid underneath to it. And you feel it in the driving experience. And as you've experienced, 
you can really do some crazy, sh crazy And it's got character. And, and it's it got does. a lot of character. It, it still maintains some of that Jeep Cherokee thing from the past that people like with styling. They haven't, you know, they've kind of reverted back from that futuristic look and it looks way more traditional than it used to. There, there's just so much good here that I'm, I'm hyper impressed at where they're going with this. Yeah, it makes me excited that Stellantis and Jeep have kind of moved away from their, their basically disposable budget car routes yeah. to really competing with everybody else. Yeah, no, they, they've elevated everything they needed to elevate. Now it's just addressing the finer details, which is everything in life, every product, every goal in life. You're just finessing the things that you're good at, and that's all they need to do here to make it even better. So, Mark, I, I guess with that, it's time for us to head into the final thoughts. Sounds good. Final thoughts on the Jeep Cherokee. This is what happens when you have some of the access to the people that worked on this. You have a better understanding of how things were made, why they were made, and some of the technical details. And we went to the launch event, so we had some of that. We saw the off-road capability, and now we got to see the real-world usability. And while it exposes some of the defects, it also brings out what it's amazing at. And that's what this is about. This is some of the best products they've ever made, and clearly underneath, they have a great understanding of how to make this an off-road vehicle and an on-road vehicle, while still maintaining its usability and adding some of the technology that people really use every day. And that's the biggest takeaway for me. Most everything is functional here. And any minor gripes that we do have are things that they can easily improve. It's not something that's gonna make you run away from this vehicle. They combine good quality physical controls so you don't have to be stuck using screens and technology or being overwhelmed by that. The interior space is a great place to be. And the usability, of course, of the hatch and the rear seats are ultra comfortable. The drivetrain is well-tuned. The At least the V8 is smooth as hell. It's quick, just quick enough of what you need for a streetcar, and the transmission programming is excellent. So the question is, how is this going to hold up? The underpinnings would suggest that it's going to be totally fine, at least in this product. The engine and transmission are largely proven over the course of well over 10 years at this point. So what are the red flags? And I, we, at this point on a new product, we haven't found too many. So we're, we're going to see how this evolves over the next couple of years. But let us know what you think. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.